Before I go on, I want to tell you about Tom Darner. Tom mowed the grass at Paoli, and I taught him to make these blades. He, he had had manual training in school, and he caught on pretty well. And I said, keep on making them, and he couldn't figure out why I wanted all these blades. Then when the time came and I was getting the wrecks, I'd say, Tom, go ahead and get another pair of blades. <laughs> and after about the third pair of blades, he said, I'm beginning to understand why you wanted so many blades. <laughs> well, then when I went to Bell, I requested to have Tom come and assist on making the large blades. But he had also helped me with his the camera, run the camera while I flew the model. And one trick he learned was disregard the wreck, just keep cranking, <laughs> keep on taking the picture, instead of looking up and running over when the thing was, that was the most interesting part. Well, of course, I had to take pictures to have a f full record of what I was doing, especially these uh, unstable flights. I wanted to demonstrate the difference in the kinds of flight, and the film was an ideal way to do it. I'd, I'd gotten interested in using film way back because my brother was uh, devoted his life to filmmaking. Well, in any case, I started early taking pictures of model flights. And when I got Tom Darner, I taught him to do it, and principally to keep cranking even if there is a wreck. So this takes me ahead now to our early flights at Bell. Uh, it turned out that the chief test pilot, Bob Stanley, felt it was his prerogative to test all experimental, all experimental aircraft made by Bell. We well, didn't know boo about a helicopter. And he, I didn't know how to fly it either, but he, he was, uh, it was his privilege. And he did several things that I didn't approve of, such as have the stick free and so on, but nevertheless, he did boldly take off, and the thing was jiggling around, and suddenly it got bucking, and I saw to my horror him thrown up into the rotor, and the rotor picked him up and flung him out into the yard. I thought this is the end of everything, and I ran over and leaned over him, and he'd just broken his wrist. But after that, he let me alone. And I did it rather slowly in my own way, what I call a captive technique of having it tied down with a cable and a bale so that it can't get away. Somebody pays out the bale or the cable, lets you off two feet, three feet. And this way, we slowly got used to it. And then I had a pilot, too, a sign, and he got used to it. And we flew it on the captive, and that's, I call it captive technique, till we got thoroughly familiar with the controls. And after a few other problems, including vibration, by July 30th of 1943, that's uh, about a year and a half after I got to Bell. No, no, it was closer to two years. Uh, we had our first real flight. We took off the legs that spread way out, put a narrow landing gear, towed it to the airport. Floyd took off and immediately was flying 70 miles an hour, out distance to car. It was just beautiful. <laughs> and from then on, we had, we were in Clover. It was just a matter of getting the bugs out and getting the engine to last more than 25 hours. That took long. One story I remember, I got interested in getting it. See, weight is, is saving weight is critical. So I wanted to cut down the weight. So I said, we're going to take two weeks now. Everyone is going to bore holes and everything, and we'll collect all the shavings till we get 20 pounds of shavings, and then we'll put it back together. <laughs> so we went through this ceremony for two weeks. It took a lot of trouble making all these, see the way these holes are in this, in this thing? Just to lighten it. 
and we got our 20 pounds of shavings and weighed the helicopter. Of course, they had, the pilot had to be in it because it has to balance. We found it was exactly the same as when we started. Where was our 20 pounds? I mean, where? And somebody thought of weighing the pilot, and it turned out he'd gained weight <laughs> sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> No, I originally had skids like my model, these uh, aluminum tubes that went out and bent up in the end so that you couldn't possibly upset. And as I said, when we were ready for flight, we took those skids off, those big things. And much later, after the thing had been licensed with wheels, I went back to the skids. Uh, that again was had to be done secretly because it wasn't approved by management. They believed the aircraft should have a proper landing gear. But you don't need a landing gear to sit down. As long as you have control, you, you, you can sit down as slowly as you please. And that was the case with the helicopter. You're not coming in at 90 miles an hour with a, a rate of descent of 20 feet a second that has to be absorbed. You come in as any speed you want. Now, if you do have an emergency and, and an emergency landing, then these little wheels are, uh, tend to get caught in the plowed field or something. They're not as reliable as skids. So the skids saved uh, accidents mainly, uh, reduced accidents, but it lightened the thing and it made it cheaper, easier to make, and much nicer takeoff instead of these landing gear shock things pushing one side and then the other, you're already apprehensive when you're taking off. You just take off and that was it. At any rate, the skids have been very popular. Other helicopters have them now too. Well, uh, apropos of design, I'm a great believer in letting things design themselves. An illustration was our gas tank. Our first production gas tanks were a approximately cylindrical section with straight sides. And I didn't know about it, but uh, it had to pass a 20 pound pressure test, which meant putting air pressure on the tank. And of course what happened was the sides bulged out. So that made an even better gas tank, it held more and it was stronger. So, uh, since the sides bulged out, that changed the shape so it was rejected. I changed the drawing, said uh, last, last step in the making, put on 25 pounds pressure and blow to size, and then showed these curves. <laughs> and then, of course, it would easily pass the 20 pound test. But they couldn't uh, let that stand. It was a good design feature. <laughs> it allowed it, but didn't go. Uh, this question of design, uh, the first helicopters, the ship Model 30, uh, had a streamlined nose cone and a streamlined tail cone. And then the ship 2, which was intended to carry two people, was supposed to look like an Air Cobra. Uh, also had streamlined nose cone and, and a streamlined cabin. And uh, the third one, the one that I mentioned that we were not supposed to make, which was to incorporate the best practice, we were in a hurry and we just didn't bother with the body. We just made it out of tubing. And uh, it was uh, powerful enough to carry two people, so uh, and it coincided with the time when they stopped making the Air Cobras. So everyone wanted a ride. This was the new product. And they all had their rides with no body at all. Just like flying around sitting in a chair. It was a very thrilling experience. The bubble was a happy thought from Joe Parrish, who was one of my assistants. Joe dealt with plastics and he really loved plastics. He had this idea of blowing a bubble. And I thought it was great because per personally I preferred nothing. Just going up in the air with, without even a floor, <laughs> just had these seats, 
flying through the air in this chair was a wonderful sensation. But you had to have some kind of protection when you're flying at 80, 90 miles an hour. In fact, uh, there was a story about uh, this, the early one in which we demonstrated we had nothing. And someone said to Larry, when are you going to get a windshield for the helicopter? And Larry said, would you have a windshield on a horse? <laughs> that was the spirit of those early flights. It was more fun without anything. But I saw the bubble was a great idea, and we, we tried it. It took, consists of taking a large sheet of plexiglass, and uh, it was a plastic, I mean, a plywood form cut for the final dimension of the outside of the bubble, the border of the bubble. Then heating the plexiglass, putting it under the plywood form, letting air pressure come up through the middle, and it would blow just like a soap bubble. And then we had a gauge saying how far to blow. When it reached that point, we turned off the air pressure. And that left this perfect, uh, almost spherical, plexiglass thing with the visibility was absolutely perfect through it, even looking edgewise. You could not get any distortion. And although it was only about a sixteenth of an inch thick in the thinnest part, it never gave any trouble collapsing inward or outward, whereas a much heavier straight windshield that was bent did had to be about five sixteenths thick. Of course, we we were still trying to make the ones that management preferred, which was the one with the body. Uh, I had Lowy, who was this Detroit big-time designer, worked with me, and we turned out the best we could, trying to make it look streamlined the way things were supposed to look in those days. But the body added to the weight. It took longer to, had to take the panels off to work on the engine. And it decreased the visibility. And also, the covered tail made it difficult to fly backwards, because it would weather vane around. Sometimes it was, well, it wasn't essential, but it was desirable to be able to fly backwards. Suppose you wanted to come in and hover uh, and the wind was blowing the opposite way to, from the back, then uh, you couldn't do it with the body, with the covered tail boom. I remember Larry said that uncovered tail is, the, the, the pilots fly much more dangerously with it. And I said, no, they're not flying more dangerously. They're just, no, they don't have to, uh, they can, take more chances because it's safer. <laughs> but in any case, the customers eventually decided the issue because they wouldn't buy the one with the body. <laughs> and the uncovered tail boom won out. Larry was famous for his Grundyisms. <laughs> he said, I never want to see the sun set through the tail of a Bell helicopter. <laughs> well, He'd misunderstood the thing about sun never sets on British soil. That meant that the British soil was everywhere. Well, as it worked out, the open tail was everywhere. 